to talk about movies? I know a guy. Welcome to No Snob Reviews, the podcast. And now your host, the film snob himself. Alrighty, well, everybody, welcome to the second edition. I don't know how we made it to a second episode. Somebody like this. Um, of the Film Time Review podcast here on the DP Cast Network. Uh, I'm really actually quite happy today to be joined by our special guest. You know her on Instagram as Kayla Joe Cooper. She's a specialist in all things disturbing and horrific. Amanda, say hello, Amanda. Hi. Hi. Alrighty. So she's here with us to talk about, of all the things, especially since it's Halloween time. All of all of the things horrific and, and graphic, and I uh, I want you to tell everybody about the, the type of films that you like, as well as this funny story that you have from yesterday. Well, um, so the type of cinema I enjoy are is usually um, the disturbing and horrific, <laughs> uh, trans trans I guess transgressive cinema um, pushes boundaries types of stuff. Um, so basically, last night I went to go see um, at the Chicago International Film Festival Takashi, Takashi Miike's new film, Blade of the Immortal. Um, packed theater, so I got there right before the showtime was starting. And I found one empty seat that was way in the back, and I asked to sit there, and the guy said, Sure, why not? Sat down, and the show started. So, right after the opening scene, which was phenomenal. Um, the guy is, like, literally narrating the movie to his friends. Um, I don't know how he had seen it, because it literally was the first showtime that I knew in the States. Um, so he had seen it maybe in Japan? I don't know. It did screen at Fantastic Fest in Austin. I, yeah, but I, I don't know. So maybe that's where he saw it, but then he kept making sound effects as well. Like, yes, oh yes, like, like, he remembered, like, these scenes coming up, like, oh yes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm. and I, and I don't know why, because, I mean, nothing, like, sexual was happening, um, <laughs> he gets off on violence, he knows. but nothing violent about. was happening, so it was very weird, and, <laughs> um, at one point, I just couldn't handle it anymore, so I, um, decided to, become Charles Bronson from the movie Bronson, Nicholas Wine and Red from <laughs> Bronson, and I called him a fucking cunt, and um, I ended up walking out and getting a new seat that ended up being in the front row, which kind of sucked, but uh, I had a much more enjoyable <laughs> experience after that. <laughs> so, note to everyone out there, do not, anno- do not interrupt an editor during a Nikkei film. You will get called a cunt. Well, don't you narrate a movie that. if you've seen it, and obviously it's the first time that everyone else is seeing it. Yeah, that's fair. That's <laughs> totally, totally fair. So, uh, while we're on that subject, we, I know that you like Nikkei a lot, and we, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but what, what other directors and what other films do you like so that we can kind of get a glimpse of what you enjoy? What other directors? Yeah, and what other films? So, I love Mike, um, so I, in particular of his films, I love Visitor Q, um, which you, yes. you did post in your last post on Friday for Five Films Friday. I did. <laughs> Thank you for the first um, It is his best film that I've seen of his. Um, I love it. It is his most disturbing as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah uh, me, I'm a 13 Assassin's guy. I like the, 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 the samurai. on that. So the samurai stuff that he's been doing lately is awesome, too. Um, yes. I also I like... I love David Cronenberg. Yes. Yeah. I love Cronenberg. My favorite horror movie is The Fly, so Cronenberg is my dude. I love yeah. Videodrome. That's my favorite film of his. Uh, oh, hell, The New Flesh. Yeah. Absolutely. Long you know, live The New Flesh. Funny, funny story about <laughs> that. That is a Canadian tax break film. Did you know that? No. Okay, so back in, like, the 80s, Canada used to get uh, money to make films as like so they didn't get taxed or whatever and they would make movies out of, out of these films and they gave Cronenberg a bunch of this tax pay, this uh, tax money to make Videodrome so without the Canadian tax money <laughs> Videodrome doesn't get made <laughs> it's weird right? yeah that's the kind of weird shit we talked about <laughs> yeah. that's awesome <laughs> so we got Cronenberg we got Mickey honestly, obviously you like uh, body horror then. I do yeah okay. it's awesome but you don't like Saw right? it's okay I like the yeah. first one uh, this I watched up to the fifth one, but I mean they just kind of get weird, you know. It's downhill, yeah. Right. I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, what about Hostel or and a lot of what uh, what he does as a director? 
I know that, you know, the gore is pretty cool. I liked, I enjoyed the first one. The second one's okay, too. I mean, as far as, like, actual film quality, I mean, like, the movies are yeah. mostly just gore fests, right? So they're not, yeah. like, good There's movies. There's a third one, you know that, right? No, I, I did know that, but I didn't see it. It centers here in Las Vegas, <laughs> and it's a piece of crap. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's his last couple films have been awful. I mean, Green Inferno I saw in theaters, and it was just trash. Oh, I saw it before. I saw it the year before. I saw it a year before. I saw a small screening at a festival, and it was awful. Yeah, terrible awful. movie. I mean, yeah, it's totally awful. I mean, Cannibal Holocaust I love, right? Yeah, so it's, and it's an old It's excellent, life. right. It's, and then, like, Cannibal Ferox was, like, the poor man's Holocaust, I thought. And then Green Inferno yeah. was, like, the cheapest, weirdest version of, like, that even. Well, it's like if they gave those people at Cannibal Holocaust more money to make a shittier film. Yeah. It was, you know it I mean? was just, like, laughable, and I didn't find... And it wasn't funny, though, even. He just needs to go back to making Cabin Fever, really. I liked that movie, too. Yeah, it's great. He needs to go back to making those. Yeah, but nobody You're likes right. that movie. I feel like nobody likes that movie. Oh, they, they're stupid if they don't. That scene where it's just it. their legs is just <laughs> disgusting, and it makes me uneasy every single time. I'm like, ah, I don't want to do this in my life. I don't ever want to shave my legs in my life. That's I love that, that movie. That. Yeah. Jesus. That is awful. I love that movie. adore it. Um, but, yeah, it's... No, it's awful. Don't, don't do it. Don't yeah. do it, guys. Yeah. Ugh. Now... So, basically, you're into the weird weird shit. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. So, audiences, if you guys need someone to talk to about your body horror fetish films, talk to her. Don't talk to me, because I don't like that shit. <laughs> now, as we do here, and as you guys will notice that we do here, every month we recommend movies from our four different streaming services. Um, we have, you know, your, your Netflix, your Hulu, Amazon Prime, in U.S., of course, and uh, our friends over at Tubi TV, who are always really nice. By the way, I do want to plug for all the snobs out there, I will be talking to their new director of content control, Adam Levinson, here sometime this week, and I'm going to ask him questions uh, about basically what sort of content is going to be coming to Tubi TV, why they choose certain movies, and I know Tubi just got bought out by Sony, so we're going to find in all, all of that. Uh, with all the business out of the way, uh, we're going to talk about the Netflix pick this month, and that's The Devil's Candy. And I'm going to let Amanda start, because she, she, she knows more about horror than I do, so tell us about The Devil's Candy. So The Devil's Candy is kind of like a haunted house flick, a uh, horror flick. Um, it's about a family that moves into a new house, and it's actually really unique. So the guy who made it, Sean Byrne, right? Yep. Um, so he also made a really cool Australian flick called The Loved Ones. That's awesome. It came out in 2014. Which is amazing if you, ha- if you guys haven't seen it. Yeah, it's an excellent movie that I, hi- I highly recommend. It's awesome. So then this one came out this year, right? Or last yeah, year? Technically last year, but this year, you know, in American theaters. It's a weird release date. So I really like The Devil's Candy. I think it's awesome. It's super metal. Awesome. Yes, like the, it's always good like, when you have some metal music. The soundtrack is killer. Um, yeah. There's some really... So, yeah, they move into this house, basically, and the Ethan Embry, out of nowhere, comes in. Like Papa Giorgio. <laughs> he's, the, he's the dad and is, like, basically haunted by... I don't know if he's... I don't know. It you, feels very Amityville. Yes, very, very much so. And... Yeah. But there's this... Who's, I don't know who the other guy is, though. I can't remember the actor's name who plays the... Oh, the big guy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, I actually... If you don't mind. Yeah. The big guy used to live in that house with his parents and his sister, and they all died. They all got murdered in that house. Right. From what I understand. And he's obsessed with this house because it's the only memory that he has. But the house is haunted by a poltergeist, like a spirit uh, of evil that wants to do harm to children, if I'm correct, yes? He, but he's also... Like, he has that... Like, mental, yeah. Right. He's also kind of, like, you know, possessed by... Or, you know, haunted by... Voices in his head, Voices yeah. in his head. Yeah, I just I think agree. that... So, it's... I agree with what you're saying. Ethan Embry's dope as the dad. He just has that metal dad look. He looks like my... Like, the coolest dad of the block. The thing that most impressed me about the film itself was there's some scenes that... There's some sequences that are shot that are just so well done. Like, the painting sequences in particular... Oh. That are just so, and the slow mo sequences, and the, with like you know mixed with the painting sequences that are just so well done that like you would think that he's been, he's been making films forever. 
I'm so glad you brought up the painting scenes because those are amazing. Yeah, like those are absolutely amazing. Yeah, like the slow mo with the painting, like those are just so well done. I find that the ending kind of gets a little Hollywood, kind of. It, it is a bit. It is a bit cliche, a bit Hollywood, but but you know, it's when also a little unpredictable. Game. You know, a yeah. little unpredictable. Yeah. Sort of. But you know, when you've been through that journey, sometimes you just need a little familiarity. Right, but it's still a good movie overall. I really <laughs> yeah, liked I it. I think so. So yeah. you would recommend it? I'm for sure. It. Yeah, I'm recommending it highly, and it's on Netflix right now here in the U.S., guys. So. If you have Netflix, which if you're listening to this podcast, you love movies, and people who love movies have Netflix, that just kind of goes with territory, right? Especially if you love Metallica. Oh, there's lots of... <laughs> and metal. Because yeah. yes. you'll love the soundtrack. Who doesn't like metal? <laughs> you don't like metal, you can leave. <laughs> really. So uh, our pick for Hulu is uh, a film that you are familiar with, but you have not seen yet. Is that correct? With, yes. Okay. So this one came out this year, actually, and it's called Colossal... Yeah. It's Anne Hathaway, and if you don't mind, I'll do the explanation on this one since I've seen it, and we've reviewed it. If you don't know where, where to find our reviews by now, what the hell are you doing listening here? You know what the website's called. Go, go read it. Colossal is about Anne Hathaway. She plays a woman who is kind of a slacker, doesn't really have her life together. Does this sound familiar to you about it? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know what she wants to do with her life, but she moves back home after her boyfriend dumps her. Her boyfriend's kind of rich and stuff, and he's an a-hole. Played by... Um, Dan, uh, Dan Stevens from The Guest, actually. And uh, when she gets back home, she meets up with Jason Sudeikis, an old high school friend who owns a bar. Uh, what, what starts happening, and this is kind of weird, is she discovers that she controls this weird kaiju that continues to attack Co South Korea. She doesn't know how, she doesn't know why, but she controls the kaiju that's attacking South Korea. It's a weird movie, it's a great movie, and it's a really cool exploration of what it is to not have your life together, because I can understand that one, trust me. But what do cool. you know about the film, and what are you thinking about this film? I just heard it's very outside of the norm. And, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, like, just completely out there. So I'm really interested in it myself. The director's name is, like, Nacho, so... He did, uh, Time Crimes. Yes, he did. Yeah, and I Nacho just... Nacho Galando, yes. Yeah, and I just saw that one, and I really liked it, so... It's really good, yeah. Yeah, so... so you check out Colossal... Okay. You'll like it. Yeah. The audience will like it. And if you have Hulu, which, let me tell you something about Hulu. Those guys are bringing fire in the movie department. They have great movies on there. I just saw Jawbreaker on there the other day. I love Jawbreaker. I love Jawbreaker, too. <laughs> Rose McGowan. I just love Rose McGowan. I love Rose McGowan. She, she's great. Our pick for uh, <laughs> Amazon Prime in the U.S., if you're an Amazon Prime customer, is the awesome, awesome movie, The Lobster which was nominated for uh, Best Original Screenplay last year, even though I saw it in 2015. Oh. Yeah. So it's, our review's kind of <laughs> two years old at this point, but it's an amazing film by uh, the director of Dogtooth, a great movie. Um, what do you know about The Lobster? So, I love The Lobster. Um, the Lobster takes place in this... Is it future... What, are we going to call it future world? I guess... Uh, in this Other future world where... Existence? So I call it, like, a future world where basically being single is a crime. Yes. Right? So... Yes. You basically can't be single or else you... So, yeah, basically being single is a crime. So if you are single or if, like, your spouse dies, if you are, if you are married or, like, your spouse dies and you are, are now single, you have to go to this hotel and... Find a mate within 45 days, and if you fail to do so, you're turned into an animal of your choice. Right? That is completely correct. That's the premise. Uh, but I think in Colin Farrell's case, he gets divorced, right? I thought his wife died. I, I, I don't think they make that very clear. Right. But Either way, he ends up single. You're right. Yeah. If you get turned into uh, an animal of your choice. Now, the reason for the title is Colin Farrell has selected that if he does not uh, find his mate, he will be turned into a lobster. Right. Now, what's cool about this, and this is not a spoiler, uh, the, 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 throughout most of the movie, Colin has a dog with him, and the dog is actually his brother. Right. <laughs> and it's also um, cool because we also see other sort of, like, developments where there's, like, the loners who are, like, avoiding this hotel because it's, like I said, it's a crime, so, like, people are basically fugitives, and they're, like, the loners, so, like, they're yeah, hiding I mean, and the, trying to, like, not be caught. Yeah, and that has Rachel Weiss and, and the leader yeah. of that group is Leah Sadu. Right. And they're both awesome in the movie. Yeah. You know, my favorite thing is the director, Yorgos Lanthimos, 
is a freaking genius. He is. His new movie comes out in two weeks. It's called The Killing of the Sacred Deer. I can't wait. And I'm hyped about it. It's my I'm most hyped. hyped. About it. It's my most hyped of the year. Yeah, see, I mean, it looks incredible. I love Yorgos Lanthimos. Uh, he's a great Greek director. If you guys don't know his stuff, check out The Lobster. If you're not checking out The Lobster, you should, because it's one of the most quirky <laughs> and weird stories. And I thought it was probably going to win Best Original Screenplay because it is so original. It, it is. It is so fantastic. It should have won. Um, I know a lot of people who I recommend it to, they don't like it because it's kind of hard to get your head around and the ending's very ambiguous. It's so, but the thing is, is it's so simple that it's so weird to people. Yeah, it is. It's a very simple story. It's, yeah. If you don't do this, this happens. But then he's like, I don't want to do this, so let me go talk to these people who are <laughs> in this other group of people. I love The Lobster, and I think everybody needs to check it out. Our final pick for this month is from 2 TV. By the way, shout out to those guys for always being so supportive of us, on, especially on the tweeters. Uh, so if you're not following them at 2 TV and you don't have their free app, it's a free app. Why would you not have a free app? It's free movies. I literally, I watched The Apartment the other day, two commercials, the entire hour and a half. Two commercials. That was amazing. For free. Uh, our pick is <laughs> Perfume, which is a very, very good movie with Ben Weishaw. Um, are you familiar with this one, right? You did say that? Yeah. All right, so yes. tell the audience about the sadism of Perfume. Well, I just, I know that it's about a serial killer who, what, gets a scent of a, a woman. Right? Yes, he wants to make a perfume a of perfume. the scent of women. Yeah, a perfume, yeah, a perfume on scent of women. And I looked it up and I saw that Roger Ebert gave it four stars and it's got amazing reviews and I need to see it and I'm adding yes, it and I've added it to my 2B. You yeah. did? You added it to yeah. your 2B TV queue? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I did. of course you did. <laughs> I love serial because killer films, obviously, so... Yes, she's yeah. a real fan of, of movies because she has a 2B TV app and so she understands. Yes. She gets it. She gets it. <laughs> Now, with Perfume, what's weird is it mixes all the great elements of, like, uh, Quills, you know, the Marquis de Sade, with, like, that that sort of, like, regalness that Quills has. Have you seen I, Quills? I want yeah. to see Quills. Oh, you, you haven't seen I haven't much? seen Quills yet. Oh, uh, Jeffrey Rush is, and Kate Winslet, the Queen, amazing. And so it mixes that Marquis de Sade-esque, like, French Revolution-ness with, like, the serial killer from The Silence of the Lambs with Buffalo Bill. So if you put those two guys together and like add a, a hint of Leatherface and Ed Gein, boom. Now you have your serial killer from Perfume. And My I think heart will we melt. just we have to tell Amanda to be still her heart because I think it just exploded. <laughs> my heart will melt. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> She's this gentleman. Amanda. <laughs> this month uh, we uh, also have a trailer we're gonna talk about. We both just watched the trailer for Psychopaths. Woo! Um, this thing could go either way, I think. It could either be surprisingly decent or an absolute piece of crap. Yeah. Totally. Tell us a little bit about what you think of the trailer, and then I'll go off on a tangent about uh, this, this thing here. To me, it just looks like a group of, I, I'm going to say, like, maybe three individuals wearing masks, um, who are going to wreck havoc in the evening um i don't know if they're i don't know exactly who they're targeting from the trailer but they're basically causing some violence and mayhem throughout an evening that's what it looks like do you get like a bit of hint a hint of like the strangers with the masked figures and so it looks so the masks do resemble similar to like the strangers um from 2007 2008 that year, yes, the, from that, that. that film, but, like, that movie I don't care for. Um, really? Yeah, so it was okay for the time, but the French movie, Them, is much better. Um, yeah, but that's not fair. That's during, that, This is during the French new wave of horror, where you had, like, martyrs and... No, so, so the French, mo the French movie, shit, Them, man. is a home invasion movie that came out in 2006, two years before Strangers, and it's the same movie. I know, better. but that's during that renaissance of French horror where all the sick shit started coming out. So, sorry. Um, but that was still before then, I thought. No, because I think Martyrs is what, 04? Oh, wait. Oh, wait, see, then perfect, yeah. So that, this is like on the right, the right at the beginning of this like new wave of like French... Oh, and High Tension was 04. High Tension was earlier, yeah. Yeah, so High Tension was, I think, that was the first movie that did that was like this extremely horrifying 
piece of horror cinema, and then the French just kept knocking it out, up to and including this year's Raw. Right. So, um, I don't know. I just think that this movie, yeah, other than the masks, I don't see the Stranger's resemblance other than that. Yeah, a little bit of the, yeah, I, I get that. And it, to me, it just... I saw Carnage Park, and we talked about this off-camera a little bit. I saw Carnage Park, which came out last year, and it was directed by the same director. And uh, Darling is really good, which is another one of his films. So, again, it could go either way. Now, neither of these films, as is traditional with Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, have a very good rating on them. But you, know, you should never use that for foreign or horror movies like we talked about earlier, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, as you can tell, her being a Mike fan, a lot of the movies she likes have really low ratings. On all of those things, yeah, which may which may which may play into her disdain for both of these uh, things. <laughs> I, I, I I get a sense of that. A lot now, of my movies. Cycle Pass is scheduled to open December first, but it also says twenty eighteen. So we don't really have a release date. Sorry, um, but check out the trailer. It's on YouTube. You can check it out if you guys want to be like us, be like the cool kids here, and uh, check out that trailer. Now. It's October, obviously, so it's time for everything, you know, mysterious and spooky, uh, and altogether ooky. So, let's talk about some horror and disturbing films from the past that people need. I know we've talked a little bit about it, but let's go more in-depth about this, about those type of films, and let's give some, some people some uh, nightmare fuel for tonight, shall we? Okay. You get to start, because you're the, uh, you're the, uh, you're the master of suspense here, right? Where do you want me to start? You start wherever you want. Okay, well, there's horror and then there's disturbing, and they're not necessarily the same. So let's do let's do disturbing first, <laughs> like non horror movies that are disturbing, and then we'll move into the more uh, disturbing horror films. Okay, well, I can start by talking about my favorite film of all time, which is going to be a German um, film that I'm sh I think you've seen called Angst. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So I know I know this. Yes. So. Oh, this. Right, so Erwin Letter, so Erwin Letter stars in the 1983. I guess it's a psychological thriller, maybe more so. That's, that's, fair. Um, that's fair. So it's about a guy basically who he's in prison in the beginning of the movie, and he gets released, and he's basically a psychopath. So he is has this uncontrollable, basically has this uncontrollable feeling of you know wanting to commit another crime when he gets released from prison, and he goes on to act out his, like, sadistic fantasies on this unsuspecting family. Um, and the, I call it, like, an art house horrific, like, film, basically, because it has, like, the long takes, and it has, like, the shots that, like, are really well done, and, it, and it's just, like, so well filmed, and, like, the director, Gerald Cargill, only did this one film, and it's so well done, and it's, for what the film is, it's a, it's a perfect serial killer character study on this one guy, and it's the best made serial killer film I think I've ever seen. Um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that one of the things that I, I like about the movie is there's often times in movies that are kind of disturbing where the camera will, will stay in one place, and mm -hmm. you're like, just cut, just cut, just cut, please cut, you're not cutting, please cut, and it just stays right there, and that's what he does so well, is he just builds it the disgust and the tension under your skin by just not moving the camera at certain points. Right. Just right. leaving it where it is, and it's just so, oh, oh. I agree. Like, I, I think that I, I felt literally cold while watching it. Like, you just yeah. feel like ice is running through your veins. Like, you're just like, I don't want to watch this, but you can't look away. It's like, you just have to, you have to see it through. Like, you just, like, are, you're just, like, it's like, it's a very nihilist, like, there's no humor. There's no humor. I mean, there's somebody that described something to me about the movie. Like, there is some humor to the movie, and I'm like, I don't find any of it very humorous. Um, everything is just very, very bleak and disturbing, and like, it's very German. It's so German. It's so German, <laughs> it's especially German. the sausage eating scenes. Like, you know, he's just like eating those sausages, and it's so gross. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like disgusting. It's like that is the meanest thing I've ever seen. One right there. That is disgusting. Like, very, stop doing that. Very German. Yes. <laughs> All he's missing and, is beer maidens, and it would be just, like, the perfect thing. And not only that, but, like, the the other major difference in, like, this versus, like, say, like, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, which is another... Which is another one, yeah, good mention. Which is another good one that I like a lot, but, like, yeah. um, the big difference here is that angst 
shows the aftermath too, right? So like, you see the aftermath of the killing. So like, how he's just like frantic and like freaking out. Like, I don't know what I'm doing now. Like, I he he had to do it. Like, he had to kill, and like then he does has to like deal with it. You know. So I yeah, think I that's the whole like what I really like about it and what you know. I love that movie so much. I agree with you completely in that uh, Henry is more of a fly on the wall, whereas this is more of first person. Right. Henry's third person, and Angst is very much first person, oh my dear God, what the hell am I watching? <laughs> I don't want to be watching this right now. Um, and it's yeah. very true. Uh, so good, good drop there for your first pick so far. I'm going to drop a, a more modern, uh, disturbing film. Oh, yeah, I don't know if it's modern, but, you know, F it. Uh, we're going to drop Martyrs in here since we're talking about French cinema. Okay. I find this movie completely disturbing. It's not a horror film. It's, it's a thriller. It's a suspense thriller. I wouldn't say it's a horror film. Yeah. And it is... It's an extreme abs- gore film. Like, that's what it's it is. It's terri- terrifyingly gory. But it also... I don't like gory films. I right. don't like them. And it has substance, though. I mean, it has an actual story, you know? It does, but that's what the French do. The French are all about, like, people in pain, but this time they're in physical pain instead of, like, emotion of pain, like the French are always in emotional pain. Like, you live in France, shut up. The French are always in emotional pain. Could be worse. You could be Belgian. The French are always in emotional pain. Right. That's why they always smoke so many cigarettes. Like, what's wrong with you? I'm in pain. I need need a break from the world. I don't have to do this anymore. (laughs) They're in so much emotional pain. Everything's a fucking Godard film. <laughs> you know, I think that Martyrs is good. Um, in terms of the French extreme genre, it's one of the better ones. Yeah. There's a lot of shit in that genre. So much shit. Like, there's a lot of it. Like, you're like, what the hell are you doing? And to my earlier point about emotional drama I would want to mention because it came out this year Raw is another example of like this French horror renaissance so I love Raw it's great it's great and I think she is gonna do really good things I'm so excited oh yeah oh yeah she's and her sister Ila Humph, uh is in another movie that we're, our review is gonna be up sometime this week it's called Tiger Girl we saw the Fantastic Fest um, she's a great actress the actress who plays the, the sister yeah you know, nine, old nine fingers. Nice. That's a, that's a spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen, seen the movie yet. Uh, if you don't know what I mean by that, see the movie and you'll see what I mean. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that she loves David Cronenberg. There's no way in my there's like no doubt in my mind that she was inspired by Cronenberg. Like she's inspired by Cronenberg. Oh God, yes. But uh, people don't know that movie Raw, which if you haven't seen it, you should. It was directed by a woman. Right. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it. Go see it, because it's her first feature, and I think that she, as a director, is going to be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And I cannot wait for what she does next. And this happens a lot with women nowadays, because there, there's more women directors coming out, more good ones, like Gillian Ross-Pierre. Um, there was a movie last year, Diary of a Teenage Girl, which was directed by a woman. That woman looks like she's going to do good work. Uh, again, not a, I'm not necessarily a feminist, but I do understand that we need more unique voices, and we're going to have a lot of women directors, and if they're going to make movies like Raw... Let's get let's get more of them in there, because that movie is awesome and disgusting. Mm-hmm. But the ending is, is is a bit inflating. It, the, the the ending hits you in the right in the chest when you realize everything. Yeah, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch it again now. It's so it's so I've seen it twice already. It's so good, like. And it's on Netflix it. now. What's that? And it's on Netflix now for everybody. Yes, it is on Netflix, but I didn't pick it because I figured that um, I don't want to pick all all horror movies and I like the devil. I wanted to talk about the devil's candy Mm because I knew I was going to bring up Raw in this discussion, so I did it the other way around. Um, So give me one other pick since I I just did two in a row. Something super disturbing that's not named Sallow and the Thousand Days of uh, Sodom. Please don't talk about that. I hate that movie. Huh? I hate Sallow. It's disgusting. It's not disturbing in a good way. No, it's like, Um, why are you doing this? Please stop. So, (laughs) why are you doing this? Please stop. (laughs) It's kind of bad you're really necessary. No, don't don't eat that. So let me think of a good one that I wrote down that I, um, well, we talked about. Well, we talked about, did we talk about Inside? No, we didn't. 
So inside is another French extreme one. Yes, it is. So we're already there. So let's just stay there and let's talk about inside while we're staying. I like inside better than martyrs. I can see why. <laughs> it, it's got a bit more su substance to it uh, and less violence against women. Um, <laughs> It's a good one. T t tell them about Inside so they're aware. So Inside came out before Martyrs in 2007, and it um, is about a woman who is being basically chased or attacked by a woman who's trying to steal her baby from her. And she's a pregnant woman who a woman is trying to basically take her baby out of her womb. She's like not, right out of her belly. She's like basically nine months pregnant, eight or nine months pregnant, so fully ready to like basically give birth and she's like being chased around her home. Um so it's like a home invasion movie for, of a pregnant woman. Yeah. And that actually like, happened here in here in the US as well, people for all of our world viewers. This actually happened in real life. What? Uh, a few years ago, a woman, a crazy woman, carved the baby out of a woman's stomach. The woman is alive. And oh, I did, I did remember that. Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, it's crazy shit. It was like on Craigslist. It was crazy. The movie is a bloodbath for sure. Yeah. It is very, very extreme for everybody, just so you know. Yeah. So, I mean, any of the movies she's suggesting, you should probably bring a raincoat <laughs> uh, because there's going to be a lot of blood spilled <laughs> every single place, all the way around. Uh, that's why we brought her on because she knows all. She knows her blood splattered. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention that I think that is a very good disturbing film that um, because I feel like when you mention disturbing films, you should always probably mention Gaspar No. Yes. Okay. Um, it would be his film I Stand Alone. Okay, I haven't seen that one. So um, you're so definitely have to talk about that one because you finally got one I haven't seen. Which ones <laughs> have you seen of his? Not many of them. So. Irreversible. I've seen it reverse, but yeah. And then Enter the Void, I'm sure. I'm sh I've definitely seen Enter the Void. And, oh, Gaspar, no, I've also seen the other one he did last year. I hated it. Which one? The one about the sex and the negative people. What? You're talking about Gaspar Noe, right? Yeah. Which yeah. one is that? He did a movie last year. Um, <laughs> oh, Love? What, is it? what was it called? Huh? Love, yeah. So I didn't see that. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, yeah, I heard that. It does. Yeah, it's so, absolutely dead. I Stand Alone is about a guy who, he's a butcher, and... Oh, here we go. So he, <laughs> he did, so a horse meat butcher. Oh, God. <laughs> and he has a mentally handicapped daughter. Oh, wow. Um, what? This is going to get really bad. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it does. So you wanted me to talk to you. <laughs> yes, go, go, tell him. I want them to know about this. Go. So he has a mentally handicapped daughter. So it actually was a short film called Carne, which means meat in, Fran in French. So it it's was a short film. Spanish. So yeah, so 30 minutes of Carne, and then it turned into I Stand Alone. Um, so this butcher has a mentally handicapped daughter, so someone attempts to rape her. And so... He goes to jail, basically, because he goes, you know, crazy and attacks them. Okay. So he's released from prison. He's, like, uh, dating this woman. Um, his daughter gets sent to a home while he's in jail. And then, so this movie takes place after he's out, and she's in this home. And then, so he's, basically, the movie is him trying to re, like, kindle his relationship with his daughter. Um, okay. So it's that whole journey of that. Um, but the movie is very disturbing in many, many ways. So the movie is very heavy on narration from the butcher. Um, and also, like, he's very, very, you know, like, very depressed. Like, he's very, it's very, very, like, just negative in every aspect. He, like, hates the woman he's with. Like, um, you know, just hates people in general. He hates is everybody. It French? Yeah, it's a French film. Um yes. You know, it takes place in Paris, but, like, kind of in, like, you know, a really shitty area in Paris. And, like, you know, yeah. always meet... He's coming into contact with just, like, really shitty people and shitty scenarios. And, right. Um, it's a very... It's obviously a very, very dark and disturbing film. Um, but it's very, very good. Uh, so not for everybody, for sure. I can't think of what I would compare it to if I were to recommend it to the... A particular person. Yeah, don't, don't don't ever try to like categorize Noe. Right, I know. Like category. you just have to you just have to like him, and I feel like you should see his other stuff first before you go for I Stand Alone because it's it gets really the last thirty minutes get really um 
you just you can't you won't be able to handle it. I think yeah, I think you're right. I think Enter the Void is a good intro. Uh, you should see yeah. your Sea Blaze second to last, and then probably watch this one last. Yeah, Enter the Void is Enter the Void is a good place to start. Yeah, then Irreversible is probably good for second, but I stand alone. Yeah, definitely last. And then you can skip Love unless you want to watch a bunch of French hipsters <laughs> be naked on the bed together. <laughs> Is that pregnant. really all it is? It's disgusting. It's like, I'm pregnant. I'm not. Let's have sex. Okay. No, 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 no. Harry, rubby parts. Rubby, 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 rubby. <laughs> That's the whole movie. I hate, I hate that that movie. I, I literally said, I don't know what's sticky. The situations of the seats after this thing. Ew. Yeah, it's disgusting. I never, I was, really, I never was interested in that one, really. I hate it. Uh, although Irreversible is amazing, but also really hard to get through. So. It's hard to get through, but it is very good. It's very good. Monica Bellucci fucking great she's so good mm -hmm. she's so good so uh, do you have any other maybe more domestic picks for the audience out there because everything you picked so far French I can go Haneke yeah that's okay yeah that's good yeah that's good or that's let's see Haneke. domestic you mean you mean American yeah domestic or right. um Just give us one American film. One American disturbing soon. film? Yeah, because I think The Girl Next Door is pretty disturbing. That one is disturbing. I agree. I had it on my list. And it's American. Yeah, we and could talk should, about that one. You should definitely caution yourself when you watch it because... Or oh, Bad Boy, or Bad, or Bad Boy Bubby. Is that... I don't know this one. Bad Boy Bubby. Maybe American? Uh, I don't know. I'd have I to guess we could find out, right? I could find... <laughs> I just watched this one, like, a couple weeks ago. Really? Yeah. What's it about? Um, Bad Boy Bubby was about a man, or a man who was, um... It's Australian. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I never watched, I never watched directed, anything. Directed by a Dutchman, and it's Australian. Alright, close enough. That's not even close. <laughs> That's the other side of the world. What are you talking about? They speak English, Okay. Yeah, that's what you want to call it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, The Girl Next Door is a good one, because that, that one's very good, and it is very rough. Yes, I mean, and there's two movies about this same situation, but um, the other one's not good. It's called An American Crime, and it has uh, Catherine Keener, who's awesome, but not good in this movie, and uh, What's-Her-Face from Juno in it. Yeah, no, The Girl Next Door is, is a very good movie. Yeah, it's very good. It's also it also does not pull punches um, when it comes to the actual events that this young woman had to deal with. Yeah. So it's based very, on yeah, based on the, based no, on the Jack. Ahead. So Jack Ketchum wrote the novel. Um, it's based on the true story of a girl who was basically was she adopted by this this woman? So what happened was her mom was kind of their, their family was kind of poor and they just kind of got left there. So I thought that this girl was, like, adopted. Like, this one woman, and she lived in Indiana, I believe. Like, this, it, it was, this like, yeah, older Indiana. woman was in, in Indiana, and she, like, took in this woman, this girl. And I think a couple other kids, too, that weren't hers. And she, yeah. but she targeted this one particular girl. And she basically made her, like, this, she targeted this one girl and tortured her, basically. And yes. she targeted yeah, that's exactly in, right. Yeah. She tortured her in front of all the other neighborhood kids mostly little boys yep um and did just like really unspeakable things to her um for their entertainment basically and they kind of all participated based on like the woman asking them to and you know she was the older woman and like they were naive and like little kids so they kind of just did what she said and no one kind of told anybody like the kids never told their parents and like this kind of abuse went on for years, and, like, I always recommend in these kinds of scenarios, like, another good one of, that's similar to this, in a way, is the Snowtown Murders, which is... Oh, great maybe, Australian film. Right, so Snowtown great. is another good true story that's kind of similar in a way, but, like, you know, no one kind of did anything. No, well, someone did something. There's a floor scene. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, but that was a long time out. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm saying that... I don't know. For Girl Next Door, like, for these types of films, I always, like, say watch it first and then read about it afterwards. You yeah. know, instead of do it, read it first and then watch it. Um, so same with, like, Girl Next Door. Like, watch it first and then read about it. I ended up buying this film first, and then it's like, I don't know why I bought it, because it's like, I'll never watch it again. <laughs> yeah, uh, you end up buying it because the girl on the cover 
has a blindfold over her face and the whole thing is red. <laughs> so that might be it. It's so crazy. It's like, oh, that looks like right up my alley. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, you regretted that immediately. I'm like, I'm gonna watch this again. I can't watch this again. <laughs> it's it's really it's really bad. Uh, it's the, the the nature of the the violence that this poor young lady had to go through is un, almost unspeakable. I think it is. But it's a great film. Uh, also, great pull with Snowtown, one of my favorite Australian movies. Um, it's poor so kangaroos. Good. Poor poor kangaroos. It's such a good movie. It is. So, great pulls for so far. So, I think that about covers a gamut of some disturbing stuff. So, let's get a little bit more into some horror, some ooky spooky stuff for the uh, Halloween crowd here. What are, what are some of your favorite Halloween movies? Maybe some of your favorite horror movies? I'm pretty, like, easy with that stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, standard, typical, old school horror. I like that. You know, I, lo- I love slashers. <laughs> See, I'm not a slasher person. I like a Hellraiser. I'm a Hellraiser guy. I myself. love... I'm, a- I'm in love with Pinhead. <laughs> I, we talked about this, yes. Uh, Hellraiser is my favorite of the 80s uh, horror genre films. Uh, I'm not a huge Freddy guy. I'm not a huge Jason guy. I like Halloween, um, but I'm not... Like I said, I'm not a slasher guy, so... I, I-, I like a lot of those films, but uh, I love Hellraiser because Hellraiser's more demons and, you know, demonicness and... Evil. I love it. Yeah, I'm very much in love with Penhead. I, I love, um, who did the artwork there? Who, who's the guy? Uh, what's his face? Clive Barker. I love Clive Barker. Um, and I just saw a movie where there was like an artist doing painting some stuff, and all the paintings were done by Clive Barker. Yeah? Yeah, it was this movie called Dog Years. It's from it's coming out next year, I think. It's by A24. Nice. And it has Burt Reynolds in it, and Ariel Winter is like an artist, and she paints, and all the paintings that she did in the movie were painted by Clive Barker. So, you know it's kind of some demons and weird shit. You know what to expect. <laughs> the yuki stuff. See, I like untraditional Halloween stuff. Like, I'm a huge fan of, like, uh, you know, I like uh, Repo, the genetic opera, Little Shop of Horrors, Nightmare Before Christmas. Those are all musicals. I am aware of that. Please don't make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love musicals. I will admit this. Well, I have admitted this. Yeah, I love Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, oh, yay. I love Leatherface. I oh, love the new Leatherface movie does come out next week too. I yeah, is that the one that's they're gonna look at him as a kid or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. Which is always a mistake because right. now there's two movies about vile people coming out of when they were kids. You have Leatherface, <laughs> which is, explores the fictional Leatherface character based on based on Ed Gein. And you have my friend Dahmer, mm-hmm. which is I've, I've seen currently holds a ninety one percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but I hated the movie. So you know that d- didn't Dom and Dahmer's parents even went on MSNBC at one point and gave an interview saying that like there was a time when he was a kid where he fell off of a swing or something or like he fell out of a tree and hit his head and that ever since then he was never the same and that's why they think he was a serial killer. No, I don't think that's why he's a serial killer. I think he no. was a serial killer because his dad let him experiment on animals in, in, the, in a shed in the forest. No, I'm just saying they did that, and I believe that that's why they went on. They went and did that because I think they got money probably for interviews and stuff, but, like, they did that. Yeah. And then I think that that's where all this stuff came from, I think. Now, the, well, the My Friend Dunn was based on a book. Right. By Dorf, the, what's his name, Dorf Dorfson? One of his friends from high school? That's his name. Oh, my gosh. The kid's played by one of the Wolf Brothers in the movie. Um, and it's the movie... I don't like explorations of people this vile that don't project them as the vile creatures that they are. And it, tr- it almost tries to oh. justify his... Why they're dying. Sins. Yeah. Yeah. Justify his sins by saying, oh, he's just misunderstood. No, he's an asshole. Right. F no, that I, guy. I agree. That's, it's wrong to do that. Yeah. And I... I but back to the more sunny stuff that I like. I like The Little Shop of Horrors. I love it. It's a great Christmas movie. And Rocky Horror Picture Show. Also a great Halloween movie. I haven't Just seen either one of those. Now. What? <laughs> okay. So no excuses, because they're doing a screening of that on the 29th and the 31st of Little Shop of Horrors, so you can watch it and enjoy it, and Rick Moranis being awesome. Okay. So there's no excuses for you not seeing it now, because... Uh, they're playing it in theaters again. Okay. Uh, you know, and I like Nightmare Before Christmas. So I can sing along to all those songs, and I enjoy that movie very much. Um, I like I like Halloween movies. I do, um, but I, th- I feel like any oh, and every Halloween I usually watch Ghostbusters and um, Evil Dead Two back to back. Evil Dead Three back to back. Army of Darkness. Really? 
Those were my two Halloween movies. I watched that, and then uh, the night before Halloween, I always watched The Crow. Nice. Do you have any Halloween traditions? The Halloween franchise. I watch Halloween. Halloween. There's like 19 of them. No, I watch Halloween, Halloween 4, Halloween 3, Halloween, Halloween 3, Halloween 4, and 6. So you mean you don't watch H2O with a great performance by no. Busta Rhymes? That was... So, Busta Rhymes was an 8. Is that H2O? <laughs> H2O was Josh Hartnett. <laughs> and, Mi- and, Michelle Wa- Hartnett and Michelle Williams, which was awful. I hate that. Oh, uh, it's Kelly Rollins, isn't it? Tony Rollins? Yeah. I don't remember which one she was in. Was yeah. she uh, in one? It's awful. They're all, they're all pretty bad at that point. Yeah. Sure. It took, it was like late, mid, early 2000s, late 90s, they were like, let's take all the cool stuff from the 80s and make it shit. And I'm trying to get all excited about this new one, and I don't know why. No, because Rob Zombies isn't good either. I don't like it. Uh, it's, I don't, don't even get me started. I'm so I don't particularly angry. enjoy Rob Zombie as a director anyway. I, but. He's bad. He's bad. Yeah. Yeah. He, he needs to just, just do big Dragula. Just sit over there and make your, your music, and you're pretty good at that. Dude, just do that. He's okay. Just do that. He's okay. Yeah. Just do that. Don't try to make movies and they're because you're bad at it. <laughs> and everyone argues with me about this, but I stand by my decision that Rob Zombie is a terrible director and everything he touches is absolute crap. Have you seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre too? I don't want to. So don't. But if you ever do, you will realize that Rob Zombie has created his entire career based off of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Because everything that he's done in any of his movies is ripped off of from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And I realize this because I just saw this for the first time a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, really? his entire career is ripped off from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 out of See, all movies. That's weird. Because The Devil's Reject, it, it, it has some redeeming qualities. Not many. But I bet you, if you name, name two. Witches of Salem. If you, no, if you name any redeeming qualities from Devil's Rejects, they're probably ripped off of Texas oh. Chainsaw Massacre 2. Well, and actually, no, I, I kind of like that whole co- subplot with the cops thing. That really reminded me a lot of uh, Natural Born Killers. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Fair. Okay. And, so, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's about it, really. <laughs> it's insane. I couldn't believe it when I watched that. And I hated Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 so much. It's not good. Okay, so bad. Good. I'm not going to see it. So. Don't. I'm definitely not going to watch it, so that's good. So, we talked about the spooky, the ookie, the altogether ookie. That's awesome. We've got all the Adam's family stuff out the way. So, let's close this all up by uh, uh, tell, uh, tell the audience the best film you've seen in the last month. Meaning, from when to when? Uh, from, let's go from uh, the entire month of October. Or late September. We'll, we'll count late September. You go first. Oh, well, because mine's going to bleed into our uh, discussion for this, uh, our November film that we're going to discuss, which is, uh, because it's the best movie I've seen all month, and that's Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, which is also our pick for November for everybody to go check out. It currently holds a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's definitely going to be there in February when the Oscars come out. It's going to be all of the awards. Um, So, if you want, I can can go first and tell people about this wonderful movie. Awesome. I'll do that then. Okay. Uh, this movie is Frances McDormand plays a mother uh, of a murdered daughter. She was m- raped, murdered, and burnt to death. Um, the cops are not investigating the murder, uh, led by the sheriff, played by Woody Harrelson, and his deputies, uh, one of which is Sam Rockwell. So she rents out these three giant billboards right outside her home, which is off of the main strip of the, uh, sh- uh, you know, of Ebbing, Missouri. And she calls out the police on these billboards, uh, pondering why they have not investigated this. It's a very powerful comedy that I think perfectly balances a black comedy with heavy drama to give this sort of beautiful tone that I think Martin McDonough, the director of this film, who also did In Bruges and Seven Psychopaths, perfectly balances up. And it, it's, it's his best work, and I love both of those other two movies I mentioned, because In Bruges is awesome, and Seven Psychopaths is underrated as shit. Um, but I think that everybody needs to see this film when it comes out November 10th, and you're either going to leave the you're either going to leave the movie profoundly imp- uh, affected, crying, or just stunned by this, this movie. It's an absolute stunner of a film, especially the ending. 
So that's my play for people to go check this out because it's the best film I saw. And I saw it last week at the San Diego International Film Festival. When does it get released again? November 10th. November 10th. Awesome. So everybody should check that out. Now, our lovely guest Amanda here is going to tell you the best film she saw all month. So I'm going to go with Polytechnique. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's that's a rewatch or is that a first watch? First time. Really? That's Denny Villeneuve, is it not? Yeah. All right. Tell, you... tell, tell me about your experience with Polytechnique because I always love talking uh, Villeneuve with people because he's such an interesting director. You've seen it? I've seen all of Villeneuve's film. Oh. Man, I so I saw it early October and it like shattered my entire <laughs> yeah like by, like everything like my emotions everything like that movie what he did and was able to accomplish in like 70 like 80 minutes or whatever it was it's like an hour and 20 some minutes and it's like yeah. filmed in black and white and that was such an amazing perfect choice um to do what he was able to accomplish and do in those 80 some minutes was amazing um, I've always been impressed with the way he's always been able to develop his characters and portray like their emotions in like chaotic situations and kind of unforeseen kind of situations that come up. I feel um, like he he includes you in the world of his movie. He dedicates to one per- personality to each character, right? So he like he dedicates to like their personality, and this is exactly how they're going to respond to every situation in that world, right? So like. This is what they're going to do no matter what. And Incendies is a great example of exactly that. And Prisoners. So, like, like Hugh Jackman, like, how he acts. Like, he never doesn't act that way. Like, he doesn't, like, come around, right? He doesn't, like, change the way he acts in that situation. He's always irrational. Right. So, like, and that's exactly how this is. And he also, like, the way he portrays that the shooter in the the polytechnique is completely one-dimensional versus, like, how he portrays the girl. Like, I just... Blew me away. The film is phenomenal. It's actually my favorite of his. Um, I love Ooh. it. Ooh, I don't care what anybody says. It's my favorite of his films. I love. Good. I love so many of his films. I think that all of them are great that yeah. I've seen of his. But this one, it just like for me, the way it affected me emotionally. I think I watched it at the time that I did. Like it was the beginning of October after just what happened here in America, anyway. Um, I live in Las Vegas. So. I know. So it was right around that time that I watched it, too. So it was, like, I think emotionally, just, like, around that time, it was just, like, this movie, like, the way... It's the best movie on that topic that I've seen ever. So, um, but... Blue Caprice is pretty good, too. What is it? Blue Caprice. I've never seen... the Beltway Shooters. I've Washington never seen DC. that one. Oh, it's on Netflix. You can check it out. You should check it out. It's really good. I should. Yeah. But, yeah, no, it was, it was really, really good. I... I can't agree with you any more than that. I love that you brought up a, a Villeneuve film, especially with our Blade Runner 2049 review just came out today. It just printed today, so... Denny Villeneuve is the man. Every <laughs> film he touches is gold, and Polytechnique is one of his most personal films. It is. I, and I it, think... I want him to, like, go back to that kind of stuff, though. I want him to go back there. Me too. I think he will, but I think at this point he is such an art tour, but he's such a... Yes. Pop culture art tour at this point. He's the perfect mix of like Spielberg, and 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 like um, and like a guy like uh, Tarantino, where he's like he makes these small art house kind of films that are done his way, but also the audiences want to come in like a Nolan or Spielberg. Do you know what I mean? A mixture of that, and I think that started with uh, Enemy, which no one saw. But Enemy's amazing, and I Prisoners know. was like. The opus of that, like everybody saw Prisoners, everybody liked Prisoners. It's a great movie. It mm-hmm. made it hurt feelings, and it made people feel awkward. I think that he is one of the direct, one of the most influential directors in the actual art of cinema, not just in film mm-hmm. today. And I love him. And it, it is pronounced Denny Villeneuve for all of you heathens who cannot <laughs> say it correctly. He's French Canadian, damn it. Yes, he is. Say it correctly. So I hate it. They're like. It's Denny Villeneuve? No, it's Villeneuve. It's, it's Villeneuve. No, it's fr- no. He's not. He's not from. No, stop it. Stop it. Like you just mentioned, you liked all of his films. Can anyone name a bad one? No. No, you can't name a bad one. He doesn't have a bad one. I. Mm, no. No, exactly. Incendies is good. Polytechnique is good. 
Uh, I still think, well, I still need to see Maelstrom. Oh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. You'll like it. Uh, Maelstrom's good. Sicario's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of it. Blade Runner's good. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen the original Blade Runner. <laughs> you should get on that, too. Don't tell the people that. They're going to start booing you. I know. Sorry, guys. Boo this woman. Don't do that. She's very nice. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> now, that's, that's, literally, that's all I have to say. Uh, that's our show for this, this month. So let's, uh, let's get the people uh, where they can find you on all of the social networks, if you have more than one. Just Instagram. Just Instagram, and it's at Killer Joe Cooper, right? Yep, just like the movie. Is that in reference to the movie with Matthew McConaughey? It is. There's a weird, uh, weird corn dog scene in that movie. Everybody should check that. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's right. It's chicken. Oh god, that thing is creepy. It's a creepy movie. Now, of course, I am William from Film Snob Reviews. You know where to find us. All the social medias. If you have one, we're on it. If you're not following us on, it, again, why are you listening? Uh, it's at Film Snob Reviews. We have a Patreon. Give us money because we like money and we need money uh, to keep this thing going. Um, other than that, uh, if you have any topics you want us to discuss, any movies you want us to discuss on next month's episode, which is going to be November, we're going to have the lovely Bob K.S. Movie Mini on next month. He's a knucklehead. It'll be fun. Uh, we're going to talk about holiday movies. It's, I think it's his birthday next month, he says, so we're going to talk about all that craziness. With that being said, thank everybody so much for joining us, and until next time, bye. Bye. Say bye.